back everyone to preterist apologetics here on uh, youtube and facebook and what have you uh my name is don k preston i'm the president of preterist research institute that's my very good friend up up top there uh mike sullivan boy we appreciate you being with us we appreciate all the wonderful comments that we're getting on youtube the great great feedback that we're getting and so want you to want you to please keep passing the word Okay. Oh, uh, I have a I have a quick announcement on that. Um, sure. I am really close to having a thousand subscribers on my YouTube channel, and apparently something happens at that. I guess you get monetized or whatever. So, if you're out there, if you could please go to my YouTube channel. It is at Michael Sullivan six eight six eight, and just like and subscribe, and maybe kind of get me there to a thousand. That way, I might get a couple of bucks every once in a while. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's great. That's great. Uh, let me encourage everyone to do that because it really does help. I mean, uh, believe you me, it's not like we're, we're either one of us going to get rich. <laughs> no. I can assure you of that, but nonetheless, uh, every little bit helps. And um, if you enjoy, and if you're benefiting mostly yeah. from what we are doing here, then do that little bitty bit for us and uh and it will help to be sure uh thankfully i'm i guess you could call mon monetized have been for a good long time i'm up to um Se 75 8 000, something like that uh i think the last time i looked it was close to 78 uh 7800 i think or 7.8 uh yeah th i think that's right and uh, I, I'll be really honest, I hadn't even noticed how many I had. And somebody sent me a, a note on YouTube, and, and this was when I had just reached 7,000, and said, hey, congratulations, dude, you got 7,000 subscribers. And I go, really? <laughs> and, and I looked, and it's like, oh, well, that's cool. And it's one of those type of things, you know, growing up as a minister, I never thought I'd have a congregation of 7,500 people. <laughs> There you go. There you go. But that's certainly one way to look at it. And so uh, anyway, we appreciate the support that you give us, folks. And that's one small way that you can you can help us both out to be sure to subscribe. All right. Well, for the last couple of weeks, we've been focused on the recent debate between Dr. Michael Brown and Steve Gregg on the future of Israel. Most of you probably know that Michael Brown is what he calls himself a historic premillennialist, says he's not a dispensationalist, but I can tell you, having studied dispensationalism for the great part of my life, he sure makes an awful lot of dispensational arguments. And at times I have wondered, okay, where's the difference? And, you know, he'll, he'll try to explain that here and there and where, where have you. And I still go, uh, no, you still sound like a dispensationalist, but, uh, it's Steve it's Greg. like it's mostly hit the rapture and and the tribulation uh just that small difference there but everything else seems to be the same well actually he claimed in one of my debates with him i've forgotten which one he claimed that the totality of daniel 9 was fulfilled in the first century by ad 70. now that is an incredible divergence from dispensationalism well i brought that up in my debate with him and he hemmed and hawed and he said i misrepresented him and i had the quote on the slide and but but if you notice that in your debate with him he tried to get out of it by saying the atonement started in ad 70 but it won't be completed until the second coming so he's kind of got that already and not yet of the atonement but everything else like um the filling up of the measure of sin he saw that he sees that as AD 70. Yeah. But that's, so that's a consummation in AD 70, whereas now you're taking one of these other things and stretching it out thousands of years. And it's, it's very inconsistent. And, you know, in my debate with him, 
verse 24 was really important because that's when the office of prophet um, is stopped and ceases to exist when all prophecy is fulfilled. And uh, so <laughs> I really wanted to hammer that point home say, hey, dude, you can't say that the 70 weeks were fulfilled in AD 70 yep. and still hold that, you know, you're a prophet and you're prophesying. But. Especially when some of his prophecies have failed. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And his apologies aren't really that, uh, you know, apologies. Uh, I, I can't, uh, I can't for the life of me imagine Isaiah standing up and saying, <clears throat> uh, brethren, I'm really sorry that I blew this prophecy, but hey, you know, things happen. <laughs> well, you know, in his book, Strange Fire, of course, I read that many times. And in the back, he's got an appendix uh, by Sam Storms. Sam Storms admits that New Testament prophets can be mistaken. And so that, you know, he, he totally redefines prophet. And uh, so, you know, these guys like Michael Brown, he can utter a false prophecy or, or Sam Storms can utter a false prophecy and it not be a big deal um, to them. But, uh, you know, scripture wise, they'd be stoned. Uh, well, the, Steve, uh, Steve Gregg tried to make that delineation between Old Te Testament prophets who who said thus says the lord and he makes the argument that since the new testament uh apostles never say thus says the lord that sets them apart from the <laughs> old testament authoritative prophets they're and just writing scripture that's yeah they're, they're just writing scripture <laughs> and, and so that that means that the new testament writers are not as authoritative and it means that they could possibly be wrong and right. when I read that in his book, and he had not said that in our debate. So when I read that in the book, I was like, where, and of course, I was familiar with, with Michael Brown's view that, yeah, the New Testament writers got it wrong. Uh, so it, it's stunning that you could have men who are claiming to be Christians, followers of Jesus Christ, and saying his his own divinely appointed apostles and prophets were wrong. They were misguided or something. I, I, I don't think they want to use the term misguided since they understand they were guided by the Holy Spirit. So <laughs> that would be, a, that would not be a good thing for them to say, but to say that they could possibly be wrong. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, it's interesting <laughs> talking about this debate that they had, they're, they're like two ships passing in the night and it's the same with the charismatic issue. It's like you have more than half of the church saying the gifts have ceased, you know, the sign and revelatory gifts have ceased. And then you have this unfortunately larger part just growing and growing, uh, the Pentecostal and charismatic movement saying, but wait a second, if we're still in the last days, Acts 2, if the Great Commission hasn't been fulfilled, Mark 16, 15 through 18, Matthew 28, 18 through 20, um, if that which is perfect, the second coming and the arrival of the new creation hasn't occurred, hey, then these sign and revelatory, well, they don't want to say, I guess, revelatory gifts in a minor way, not in the way of scripture. Yeah, they, they don't want to redefine everything. Yeah. Right. So th the point is, is that you have, again, two ships passing in the middle of the night. It's one is correct saying that they've ceased, but don't have the exegetical answers to prove it. Right. And then you got the charismatics having to redefine what prophecy is, redefining what a prophet is, redefining what tongues are, a known foreign language that you've never studied, not gibberish. Right. And But they're correct saying that, hey, if the second coming, if we're still in the last days and the new creation hasn't arrived and we're not face to face, that, and then, and then preterism is right here. Mm -hmm. It's like, you're both right and you're both wrong. And Don, isn't this what we're seeing in this debate? We've got Steve Gregg, correct, developing the remnant concept. Yes. Developing the idea that the promises were always to the faithful remnant. Um, and going through Romans 9 through 11, developing that. Uh, unfortunately, not getting into the Old Testament passages, not getting into the fact that it's at the second coming when Christ comes out of Zion to forgive sins, to consummate and bring the new covenant to its fulfillment. He avoids that. Uh, we saw in Ze Zechariah 12 through 14, again, it's the second coming, 
right? And he he was a no show on Brown challenging him there, and he was a no show again on the second coming in Matthew twenty three verse thirty nine. You won't see me again until you say, "Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord." So Brown is right. If if all Israel was saved in Romans eleven, then we have to have the second coming and life from the dead, verse 15, Romans 11, the resurrection has to take place. And national Israel has to be in play when all of these things take place. And Greg doesn't have an answer to that. And then we come in here and we do. <laughs> and yet we're heretics. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no, we're damnable heretics. Oh, well, that's true. That because, we are damnable because we heretics. Solve, because we solve some problems that, you know, a lot of these books, you know, four views of the millennium, four views on Romans 11, four views on the charismatic. It's almost as if they profit from shooting at each other <laughs> and no one wants us to come to the table and actually solve the debates. Well, you know? I think that's exactly right. Uh, I, it just shows the power of entrenched traditions and, and that's what it is. And there, there have been, there continue to be some really fine men on both sides, on, on all of those four views. And yet, as you and I have been showing, and as we, as the preterist movement keeps showing, it doesn't matter how good of men they are. And m most of them are good men. They, they're, they're searching, but they absolutely refuse to look at the, the contextual answers that we are providing. It, it's just like in my debate with Michael Brown. He kept going to Romans chapter 11, 25 to 27. Of course, it blew him away that I agreed that Romans 9 to 11 was about Old Covenant Israel. Yeah, he was he expecting. Said, he said, he said his, his response to you was, oh, slam dunk, like he had you. I felt like saying, yeah, wait until you get swatted right as you go up for the dunk. <laughs> yeah, I know it. And then when I showed that the very text that he appeals to for, for the salvation of Israel, Romans 11, 26, 27, is quoting from Isaiah 27 and Isaiah 59, mm -hmm. and that both of those texts are predicting the salvation of Israel at the time of the judgment of Israel predicting the salvation of the remnant of Israel, not the whole body of Israel. He literally had never heard that, evidently. He was well, lost. He, he kept pressing you. No, it's 8070 was judgment. 8070 was yes. judgment. We have to wait for the salvation. And, it's, and you kept trying to rein him in and bring him back. But Mike, the text is saying there's salvation at the time of judgment. And he just, it just, and, but, you know, the great thing about it is he actually finally admitted, well, yes, yeah, that's that's really what it says. But, boy, I mean, he just glossed right over the admission to get back to a denial of it, <laughs> you know. Yes. But, yes. but the text was there. By this, this is the means by which God yes. would take away their sin when the fortified city is destroyed, when the altar would be turned to chalk stone. When the people whom he had created would no longer receive mercy. Isaiah 27. Oh. Isaiah 27, 9 and following. Yeah. And I mean, there nothing could be any clearer than the language of Isaiah 27, 9 and following. And that is the resurrection. Oh, that is, that, that's that's the gathering of Matthew 24, 31. When the Son of Man comes upon the clouds, he's going to gather the elect. And again, that's a problem for both of these men because <clears throat> now. What is Steve's great last I when I listened to his audio messages, I haven't read his book um, on Matthew 24. He took like verse 27 as AD 70 and then maybe 30, <coughs> the end of world history. He took one of those as AD 70 and one future. Do you remember which one? Actually, he took verse 30? 27, if I remember correctly, about the sun shining forth from the east and the west. That's the end of world history. That's okay. the end of world history. But so then he 30. returned to verse 29 through 31 as AD 70. Okay. Okay. He slices and dices, just like so many commentators do, uh, because they've, they've got to have the doctrine of the end of time. Somehow, some way, they've got to read it into the, pardon me, into the text. Instead of seeing that Psalms 97 is behind it 
And Psalms 97 has nothing whatsoever to do with an end of time coming of God. And yet that's where Jesus is drawing from. As the sun shines from the east into the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. And, and of course, they completely overlook the fact that Jesus uses this terminology of the coming of the Son of Man, which, it's, which is itself a delimited reality. There's only one prophecy in the Old Testament predicting the coming of the Son of Man in judgment. It's Daniel chapter 7 that mm. would occur in the days of the Fourth Empire, i.e. the days of Rome. Yes. You have, we yeah. have no exegetical basis whatsoever for removing a, a prophecy of the coming of the Son of Man in judgment mm. from that temporally delimited framework of the Fourth Empire, i.e. Rome. And yet I'm commentator after commentator does that. I know, I know. Um, question for you. Acts 111. Um, I haven't gotten into Beale and Carson, but what Old Testament text do they reference that to? Is it Daniel 7 13? I mean, it's the only one. It, it could be. Yeah, yeah. Generally speaking, Daniel 7 in modern commentators is linked directly uh, to Acts chapter 1. Now, mm -hmm. here's what's Here's what's really fascinating. Uh, Greg Keener, in his commentary on Acts chapter 1, says, In the early church, Daniel 7 was never linked mm -hmm. to Acts chapter 1. They never appealed. When, when they as wanted, far as the ascension, you mean? Yes. Okay, I'm, I'm talking about him coming back. In, in well, a or... yeah, the like manner. They, they do not link in like manner to Daniel 7. That's weird. In fact, uh, Keener says that in the earliest of the church commentators, they linked Acts chapter 1 with Psalms 110, which is what I do. Yeah. The ascension part, verse 9. Yeah. 110. Yes. Yeah. But but him coming in like manner, the only other cloud coming uh, would be uh, Daniel 7, 13, just because it doesn't say son of man coming in <laughs> yeah. a similar way. I mean, that's, uh, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, but it you is know, interesting. Yeah. It is interesting that Matheson says now Acts 111 coming in like manner on the clouds doesn't have a time statement, but we can know when it's going to be fulfilled. And he shoots himself right in the foot. He says when verse eight is fulfilled. Yeah. Talking about the, the Great Commission. And we just we looked at that here in our study of of Romans. Um 1018, their voice yes. has gone out into all the gi, the earth, and their words to the ends of the world. Well, one of those is gi, but, you know, and, th and that's that's what Acts 1-8 uh, um, is teaching. So, Well, let, let's get back to Romans chapter yeah. 9 to 11 now. <laughs> and <laughs> uh, last week we, we took note of the fact, and this is something it totally ignored by Brown. And Greg, they never mentioned Romans 9, 28. We touched on it last week, but I think it's I think it's proper and right and helpful that we take a look at it again. Romans chapter 9, verse 28, and it's good to go back to verse 27. Isaiah also cries out concerning Israel, though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, the remnant will be saved. For he will finish the work, cut it short in righteousness, because the Lord will make a short work upon Israel the earth. Now, it's really fascinating, ladies and gentlemen, to see the machinations, uh, to see the word games that commentators play on Romans chapter 11, 26 and 27. My debate opponent in an upcoming debate, which will be in March, uh, it looks like the date's going to be changed a little bit uh, from March the 2nd to later in the month. But nonetheless, the uh, the, 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 my, my debate opponent says, well, we're, we're still waiting for a yet future conversion of Israel. By the way, in responding to some questions that I asked him about the restoration of national Israel, he actually said, if you're talking about the national Israel that exists over there today, that's not who I'm talking about. But I am talking about the blood descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Well, first of all, we have a right to ask, where are they? <laughs> where where are they? Yeah, and good luck proving it. 
uh, yeah, Steve Gregg says, well, you know, all that God needs for the restoration and the resurrection of Israel is a DNA database. <laughs> I was like, oh, my goodness. Oh. This is, this, talk about a new argument in the entire history of theology. So we know that Israel will be saved or the resurrection will occur because all God needs is a DNA database. So I guess I guess he could go to John Hopkins and ask for a database when he gets here. <laughs> so so let, let me let me look at their at your genome database and figure things out. It, it's it's st staggering how yeah. desperate some of these arguments are. But my point here on Romans 9, 28, 27 and 28 is this, ladies and gentlemen. Neither Mike Brown or Steve Gregg even mentioned, I don't remember it if they did, even mentioned Romans 9, 27, 28. Well, Romans 9, 27, 28 is the foundation for Romans 11, 26, and 27. I think Greg may have mentioned it when he was did developing, he? When he was developing the remnant. I, I believe so. Okay. He didn't elaborate on it, but. I, I, I certainly did not. Especially no. with verse uh, 28. Uh, I yeah, mean, verse twenty eight I mean, is the, the end of or the end of verse twenty eight. He he covered uh, verse twenty seven, the end of twenty seven. Okay, well, I simply didn't remember it then. I uh, uh, I just flat overlooked it, I guess. But the power of verse twenty eight, ladies and gentlemen, is that the Lord says, "A short work will He make on the earth," and, and He says He will finish. Well, that's the uh, Greek word suntilon. Well, it's, it's a cognate of soon with telos. And telos means goal. So you're bringing together the goal. Soon means with, with the end. So it's consummation. He's going to bring it to its desired goal. So this is talking about the consummation of the salvation of the remnant. And when people, as so many commentators do, when they extrapolate, or I, I should say they just go to Romans 11 and say, oh, yeah, uh, Paul is talking about the salvation of all Israel. They are violating what Romans 9, 28 is saying when it's about the remnant. Now, some some people interpret this as the judgment, right? That the judgment would be shortened. Is that is that how some actually uh, because there's let me different see, translations? Um, who who did the who did the Romans commentary and the word biblical commentary? Um, oh my goodness! Well, let I me can't... give you an, let me give an example. Math. This is what Matthew Poole says. Yeah. Uh, let me go up here. Cut short is his work. The Greek is which signifies his word or the account, as some read it. This is brought in as a reason why the remnant only should be saved, because God would shorten the account as we read it, make short work in the Jewish world. He would bring a sudden destruction upon that people, Sennacherib or Assyria or the Assyrians. Now here he says, or Titus Vespasian and the Romans shall make a complete and speedy conquest of them. Few of them shall remain, the greater part being involved first in infidelity and then in destruction. So that's a little bit, I mean, he's he's making the 80-70 connection, but not in the way you are. You're saying this is kind of a reiteration of what we find in Romans 11, 25 through 27, and that it's going to be a short work upon the land, how he's saving the remnant, which would be the context of the previous verse. So Yes, that, that's that's the, what I have. That's the way that I have viewed it. That, that, in other words, men like N.T. Wright say every time a Jew is converted to Christ, that's a little bit of resurrection. Right. And so he, he, he extrapolates that out over so far, 2,000 years. And every time you can look and see a Jew converted, okay, that's Romans 11, 26, 27 being fulfilled. Well, that ignores Isaiah 27 and Isaiah 59. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, totally ignores it. And, and I'll guarantee you that's exactly what Chris Date, my opponent in our upcoming debate, 
That's what he does. Now, he sees Romans 11, 15 as the resurrection at the so-called end of time. He sees Romans 11, 25 to 27, second coming, physical resurrection at the end of time. Well, you're ignoring Isaiah 27 and Isaiah 59 when you make it that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and and that, that has been my issue with so many different uh, people with whom I've had either private dis debates and discussions or whether it be a formal public debate. When I, when I debated Dr. David Hester here in Ardmore, uh, I guess that was 2012, uh, somewhere along in there, maybe 16, my opening presentation was Romans chapter 11. <laughs> a, a little bit of a backstory, folks, you have to understand in the churches of Christ, Romans 11 25 to 27 is one of those no-go zones. <laughs> you, you, you don't try to explain it except to say, I don't know what it says, but the dispensationalists are wrong. That's the explanation. And a little bit further of a story, in preparation for my very first formal debate, which was in 1983, I went to Oklahoma City to uh, what was then called OCC, Oklahoma Christian College, and I sit down with one of the prominent members of the Bible department. Uh, I mean, this guy was well-published, super duper scholar, Hebrew, Greek, you know, sight reading, all this kind of stuff. We went out to lunch and I'll, I'll, I'll call him Bill for convenience sake. And I asked him a bunch of questions here and there. And I said, Bill, I want to ask you about Romans chapter 11, 26 and 27. And he just let out a big sigh. <laughs> he said, well, Don, about all I can tell you about Romans chapter 11, 26 and 27, just hope and pray your, your opponent who happened to be a dispensationalist, just hope and pray he doesn't go there and camp out because I don't have a clue how to explain Romans 11, 26, 27. I said, Bill, you're a world-class scholar. You're supposed to have the answers, dude. And he, he just put up his hands. He said, I'm sorry. I can't help you. I don't know how to explain that yeah. text. And I think and, that's why Michael Brown thought he got you when you when you conceded. Yeah, this is dealing with national Israel at the time Paul's writing. But <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and you're right. He thought he had me right then and there. But what, what was that? Come into my lair. <laughs> come on in. Come on in. <laughs> uh, because he totally, absolutely did not understand the prophetic background. And folks, that's what we're trying to show. And that is there is a holistic view of understanding scripture that you cannot go to the New Testament. Uh, for instance, let me read you. I asked my opponent for this upcoming debate. Um, let me see it. Which question? Okay. Uh, I asked him. Who was the moderator of this debate between Greg and... Do what now? <clears throat> yeah, who moderated this debate. Between yes, in Mike fact, and... uh, it, this, his name is Chris Day, and he moderated the debate between Michael Brown and Steve Gregg. So I asked him, is your eschatological hope based upon and taken from God's old covenant promises made to old covenant Israel, Israel after the flesh? And he responded, I'm not sure I can answer the question as written. And, and he offered a few more comments, which didn't help him any more than that. Uh, and, and listen, that's not uncommon. In the, in the all-millennial world, if you suggest that eschatology is based upon God's old covenant promises made old covenant Israel, the general answer is, oh, absolutely not. We, we take our promises from the New Testament, not realizing yeah, that they're the Old Testament. That the Old Testament is the source of the New Testament citations. Right. <laughs> you know, and, the Old and, Testament is the New Testament concealed. The New Testament is the Old revealed. Precisely. Uh, uh, there's a huge disconnect, ladies and gentlemen, uh, between men like Steve Gregg. And this, you know, we've talked mostly about Dr. Brown and his fallacies in regard to Israel, but this, this exposes Steve Gregg as well. For instance, in his book and in our debate that we had in Denver, Colorado, a few years ago, Mike Zeman, my friend, uh, sponsored and organized that debate up there. 
Oh, goodness, I'm wrapped up here. Excuse me. Uh, I kept pointing out that Paul's eschatology was nothing but the hope of Israel found in Moses, the law and the prophets. Okay, so Steve Gregg in his book, Why Not Full Preterism, which was a, a an attempt, a, a failed attempt, to answer what he had not answered in the in the debate. Uh, he says, well, Preston just simply doesn't understand. Paul was using hyperbole. He wasn't intending to say that his entire gospel was taken from the Old Testament because after all, there are many things that Paul taught that are not found in the Old Testament at all. Well, included in that, he takes the dispensational view and that is the church was never predicted in the Old Testament. Well, that's just an utter fallacy. I mean, there's no merit to it whatsoever. Greg, ta Greg takes that position? Yes. Yes. And yet he's a non-millennialist. Yes. Arguing <laughs> for the remnant to here in this debate. Wow. Okay. I, believe you me, it Ooh. makes your head spin. Mm -hmm. it, it really honestly makes your head spin. Mm -hmm. You know, now, for so many years, there was what, what I think we could call a somewhat unified view of all millennialism. Most amillennialists believed A through Z, right? Well, now all of a sudden we're finding men who are amillennialists who are making arguments that I can assure you as a young man growing up in the amillennial world, I never heard, never thought about, never imagined. And when I'm hearing them from men who claim to be amillennialists and, and Kim Riddlebarger in his book, Defense of Amillennialism, he makes comments, you know, on the man of sin and the great tribulation and uh, Israel being saved, that when I was growing up, I would, he would have been run out of town as an amillennialist right. for saying some of the things that he does. So you're finding an extremely wide range of, of views under the umbrella of amillennialism, mm -hmm. or in the case of Brown, uh, of millennialism. You know, you're, you're able to hold a lot of tenets of dispensationalism while calling yourself a historic premillennialist. Pre and vice versa. So none of these things, uh, I mean, it, it's just, it's literally amazing how the, the, the changes are going on within the various paradigms. And a lot of it, Mike, I am absolutely convinced is a result of the advent of preterism. Mm, yeah. Trying to... Because you know, as well as I do, that some very, very prominent post-millennialists, for instance, such as Kenneth Gentry, man, their paradigm has just shifted again and again and again. And passages that they once upon a time would just, you know, they would almost send you to blazing hell for suggesting it was AD 70. Daniel 12, 2. Daniel chapter 12, verse 2. <laughs> now they espouse the full preterist view of Daniel chapter 12, verse 2. And they never, ever tell you in their writings, now we once held to this view. And we once condemned everybody that, yeah. you know, disagreed with us. Oh, or, now we, or that full preterists have challenged my inconsistency here a million times. And I have to admit, they were right. The resurrection right. of Daniel 12, 2 is connected to verse 7 and the time of the tribulation and that three and a half years when the power of the holy people is completely shattered. I have to admit, I mean, <laughs> he won't concede that he no, and, and the irony there is he cites John Walvoord, dispensationalist, who changed some of his views from book to book and never told anyone that he was changing. Hmm. And Gentry just rips him up, <laughs> says that's well, disingenuous. He, he should have been more honest to tell people I once believed this, I now believe this. And when I when I found that <laughs> when I found that in his quote, and I document this in my book, we shall meet him in the air, the wedding of the King of Kings, of how here's how he condemns John Walvoord for changing and not telling everyone. And yet here's his view on one of the most major resurrection texts in all of the Bible. Yeah. I mean, I've I've criticized James Jordan and even a little bit uh, Gary DeMar because he published Jordan's commentary on Daniel because he was the first domino to go in that respect uh, to take the resurrection of Daniel 12 to as not only corporately fulfilled in AD 70, but as the same time that the dead were raised out of Hades, 
Um, so he was the first, but you won't see a footnote in there that says, yeah, full preterists are the ones that came up with this. That's right. You know, and then Gentry, I don't even think, does Gentry even cite Jordan? I can't remember, but but Gentry's another one that just acts like, well, you know. I'm I came still, up with this, folks. Just, this is my idea. Lives on my plate, and I, you know. Well, the yeah. same thing happened with Jordan in regard to Romans chapter 11, 25 yes, to 27. That, I was going to say that too, yeah. You know, he he read Max King. He changed his views and never acknowledged Max King anywhere. Right. He, he It was like, now, I want everyone to know what I've come up with here. And I, I love James Jordan. Super nice guy. Uh, our debate that I had with him in Florida in 2013 was just absolutely marvelous. It was wonderful, cordial, friendly, productive, I would add. And so uh, from a personality perspective, he's just a great guy. Right. But. You know, I, I knew where he got his views of Romans 11 being AD 70. It was straight from Max King's writings, yeah. but he couldn't, he just wouldn't give that credit to what he considered at the time to be a heretic. Right, right. He just wasn't going to, going to give that. So kind of getting back here for a second, what I have seen, because I've, I've been studying Romans 9 through 11 quite a bit, and I'm actually going to get into your book here um if you guys, <laughs> it, guys if you don't have this book you really need to all right because it, it's excellent it's a quick read i'm i'm just now starting it but what we've seen when paul is quoting an old testament passage in romans 9 through 11 we either have the concept of the two-sided same coin same time of judgment is the same time israel is saved it's because it's the new covenant Israel, the remnant that's saved spiritually. The true Israel is that is saved at the same time old covenant Jerusalem is judged. So we have this theme going on every time Paul brings up an Old Testament passage. We also have um, the concept of the remnant being saved. We also have the, the concept of just blatant passages that deal with AD 70. Like you said, Isaiah 27, 9, the time of the resurrection and the time of this salvation and the forgiveness of sins is when it's the judgment of the fortified city, Jerusalem. Isaiah 69, you know, he laid a trap for them. Um, you know, when, let's see here, let their table become a snare and a trap, a stumbling block and a retribution for them. And like you pointed out, Josephus records that it was the time of the Passover. They were feasting at the Passover when um, Jesus laid a trap for them and bringing the Romans. So, uh, man, it's just like if you just read these Old Testament passages and track on what Paul is quoting, you, you will see it and you connect it with the time text. It's completely unavoidable. Deuteronomy 32. I mean, my goodness, we could go on for days on that. <laughs> Uh, yeah. <clears throat> well, as a matter of fact, before we went on air, folks, I was recommending uh, to Mike that he get a copy of this book, Heralds of the Good News uh, by J. Ross Wagner. Uh, this is one of the finest books. Now, some other commentators have done a lot of work on it. Uh, N.T. Wright has done a lot of work on the relationship between the Song of Moses uh, and Romans and Romans 11 uh, and what have you. I'm not aware of another commentator that is so thorough, so meticulous, and I might say so convincing in drawing out the, these relationships between Deuteronomy 32. Uh, he, he calls Deuteronomy 32 the gospel in Nuce. And what he means is that Paul's entire gospel uh, paradigm is found in, in Deuteronomy 32. Now mm -hmm. you think about that and, and you're going, Ooh, wow. That's saying a lot, Absolutely. but the way he unpacks it in this book is just awesome. And well, then I, I definitely will get that because you know what my topic at the conference is in a few months, my first lecture is going to be Deuteronomy 32 and how the new Testament uses it. And then my second lecture will be Psalm 110 
and how the New Testament uses that. There you go. I'll definitely be getting that book. Oh, you you got to, and you believe you me, you will thank me <laughs> for recommending this book. It is <laughs> it is totally awesome. Uh, when I I don't even know how I stumbled onto it. Now you know you, you know how it goes. You're reading a book, a scholarly book, and there's a footnote uh, of somebody, and and the footnote that they give you is intriguing enough. You're going, hmm, you know, okay. Well, my habit is when I find a footnote to a book with a comment that is intriguing, it's like, okay, amazon.com, <laughs> click. And my wife, very comment, Don, how many books have you bought lately? Well, I don't know. I'm not keeping track. <laughs> I, I, I just stack them up here on the on my desk. And when I want to do the research in that particular book, I, I grab it up and, and what have you. Uh, that that's kind of the way <laughs> that's the way my reading goes, if you if you please. But again, uh, I don't remember how or in what book I found this. But again, it's Heralds of the Good News. It's quite a lengthy book. Mm -hmm. Uh let me see here. It's uh, wow. The bibliography folks is staggering. I mean, it's just something like 359 pages long, but wow. there are multiple nuggets on every single page. And he is a classic example of as a preterist reading his book, you're going, yeah, 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 yeah. Go, 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 go. And then he jumps ship. Yeah, like they all do. Like they it's all do. like it's like reading Tom Holland, corporate body, Romans, <laughs> corporate body, corporate body, corporate body. Get to Romans eight, redemption of the body. Oh, it's not. Yeah. It's an individual. You know, yeah, same with first Corinthians, first Corinthians, corporate body, corporate body, corporate yeah. body. Second Corinthians, corporate body. First Corinthians fifteen. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> now you brought up something a moment ago, and thanks for the blurb on my book on Elijah. Let let's develop that just a little bit because mm -hmm. after all, what is Paul promising in Romans eleven, uh, twenty five to twenty seven? This is my covenant with them when I take away their sin, and, and this is one of those things that uh, this is part of the excitement to me of learning how, constantly learning how <laughs> to let scripture interpret scripture. And <clears throat> I, I have wished many, many, many times that I would have been given the upbringing. And believe you me, my dad tried to, may I use the term, pound scripture into me <laughs> when I was a young man mm -hmm. and uh, had me memorizing scripture all the time and this kind of stuff. Well, I'm thankful for that now, obviously. But when you consider how the Jews train their young boys, mm. you know, by the time they're 13, they've got to be able to quote verbatim the first five books of the Old Testament. And you're going, oh, holy cow. <laughs> I know we're going to Richard Hayes, so I'm kind of trying to look for it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> when, when you have that kind of knowledge of the Old Testament, and that's the kind of knowledge, folks, that any learned Jew would have, that when, when a New Testament writer or speaker, when Paul would stand up in the synagogue, he didn't have to say, now let me quote from Zechariah about this point, or let me quote from Isaiah or Jeremiah. He didn't have to. All he had to do was just, just give a few key words from an Old Testament text and the, and the listeners or the readers automatically knew where he was drawing from. Because yeah, it's, called they, a, it's called a hook. It's, yeah, it's exactly right. But they were so saturated with a knowledge of the Tanakh and they didn't have chapter divisions and they didn't have verses. They would simply say, well, Isaiah has said. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> I, I have said for many, many years, I, I said it 30 years ago, somebody asked me, they were commenting on how often I correlate the New Testament with the Old Testament. And I said, well, <clears throat> I'll tell you something that started me on my path. I was, I was reading again, <clears throat> Acts chapter 8, where Philip began with the scriptures, hmm. Isaiah 53, and taught to him Jesus. 
Mm -hmm. And I told this individual, I said, you know what? It hit me one day. I didn't know at that point of time, if I could go to the old Testament and preach Jesus without use of acts or Romans or whatever. Right. I didn't know if I could. And so I determined at that point of time, I wanted to know the Tanakh well enough that I could preach Jesus. I could preach the gospel out of the old covenant. Well, I'm still working on that to a certain extent. I try real, real hard. <clears throat> but coming from the background that I did, we were never encouraged to read the Old Testament. Right. After all, God nailed it to the cross. Mm. And so, and, and a lot of people seem to have that idea. I mean, after all, what did people carry in their pockets for an awful long time? Si a little simple New Testament that had the Roman way highlighted in it. It's all you needed, we were told. <laughs> and that's such a naive, uh, and I'll use the term, I, I'm not trying to be derogatory, but it's such an ignorant perspective of, of scripture. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it doesn't even begin to come close to giving us a holistic view of God's scheme of redemption, of the marvelous scheme from Genesis to maps, as the saying goes. And so, when I was looking at Romans chapter 11 <clears throat> and this concept, this is my covenant with them when I take away their sin. Of course, it dawned on me that that's naturally Isaiah 27, 9, because that's what it is. Right. But guess what, ladies and gentlemen, Isaiah is full of references to the time in which God would take away Israel's sin. Isaiah 27 is not the only one. And the one that jumped out to me was Isaiah chapter 40. Comfort ye, comfort my people, says the Lord your God. Speak comfort to Jerusalem and cry out to her that her warfare is ended. Her iniquity is pardoned, for he, she has received from the Lord's hand double for all of her sins. Now, what's this talking about? Well, you read the commentaries. John Watt in his commentary on Isaiah. This is talking about the time of God taking away Israel's sin. Well, of course it is. He has pardoned your sin. That's taking away of sin. And let, let me just interject real quick. I don't want to break your thought, but it's not out of bounds to go to Isaiah 40, especially since Paul quotes it in Romans 11, verse 14. And like That's you exactly like where we're mentioning, headed. the Jew would not just understand the one verse. He would take the entire context. And that's the exactly the theology that's ex of that block. That's exactly right. Uh, Richard Hayes calls it metalepsis, uh, <clears throat> the fancy word. And, and what metalepsis means is that, as we were saying a few moments ago, when a New Testament writer or speaker mentions just a snippet <clears throat> from an Old Testament, pardon me, an Old Testament text, the readers or the listeners would go, oh, oh okay, I know that text. I know the whole context. The New Testament writers were not as some, <laughs> as some older yet modern commentators accuse the New Testament writers of lifting quotes out of the Old Testament, completely destroying the context, completely ignoring the context, and just cherry picking little snippets of quotes for their distinctive purpose. I love the way that some of these more modern commentators such as N.T. Wright, particularly Richard Hayes, but Richard Hayes says that is co to completely misunderstand the Jewish mindset and the Jewish hermeneutic. And, and it, it accuses the New Testament writers literally of perverting the Bible. Yeah. Yeah. Well, which, which that's Michael what Michael Brown, Brown was saying. Michael Brown comes pretty close to saying that, if not saying it. Right. So um, we have here in Isaiah chapter 40, the prophecy, just like chapter 27, of the taking away of Israel's sin. Okay. Okay. Well, let's see. Uh, and it would be <clears throat> at a very auspicious event. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted. Every mountain shall be brought low. The crooked places shall be made straight <clears throat> and the rough places smooth. The glory of the Lord shall be revealed. And all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. 
folks, uh, the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Who might that be? <laughs> I, and, and again, Mike, when I was studying for that book, and that book was the outplaying and the outworking of me discovering these connections. It's just like, holy cow. Romans 11, taking away of Israel's sin. Isaiah 40, the taking away of Israel's sin, but related directly to the voice of one crying in the wilderness. And Isaiah 59, the restoration of Israel, correct? Exactly. And doesn't John the Baptist, isn't he there to restore? Is it Malachi 3, kind of restore the priesthood and restore Israel as well? Jesus himself said in Acts chapter 1, John truly was, you know, the one who is to come and to restore all things. And he uses that very distinctive Greek word uh, that is used in Acts chapter 3, 19 and following, that whom, speaking of Christ in the heavens, whom heaven must uh, receive all. until the restoration, apokatastasis. Yes. Well, <clears throat> John, Jesus said, was to restore all things. And he uses apokathistani. Same same word, just a different cognate of it. Yes. So, yeah, Isaiah 59, restoration of Israel. Oh, but guess what? Restoration of Israel at the salvation of the remnant. Yes. When the Lord would reward his enemies, thoroughly reward his enemies. Uh, and then you get into the identity of the enemies of the Lord there, <laughs> which is, is really a fruitful study for sure. Which is an echo of Matthew 16, 27, 28. For a son exactly. of man is about to come in the glory of his father with his angels to reward each man according to what he has done. That is a direct reference here to Isaiah 40 and I, Isaiah 62. Is it? Six, Isaiah 62, <laughs> verse 10, 10 and 12. Yeah. Behold, and your salvation is coming. His reward is with him. This so, is the second coming. This is when he comes out of Zion. That's where every, everyone agrees. Matthew 16, 27 is second coming. Yeah. Well, let's see. Let's go back. Let's look at Isaiah chapter 40 a little bit more carefully. You, you've already pointed us to verse 11, 10 and 11, mm -hmm. but let's make sure that we understand who this voice in the wilderness in the wilderness is. That is none other than John the baptizer because John, He's out there in the wilderness baptizing. Uh, the leaders from Jerusalem co come out to him and to say, <clears throat> tell us, are you the Christ? No. Uh, are you Elijah? Uh, no. Are you the prophet? Are you the priest? No. Well, who are you? <laughs> I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Oh, Mark death, chapter Lord. one, the oh. beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the voice of of one crying in the wilderness, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. And then he quotes Malachi chapter three, behold, I send my messenger before my face. So he conflates Isaiah 40 with Malachi chapter three. We're on really, really, really good grounds, therefore, <laughs> for, for saying, okay, Malachi 40 is Malachi chapter three. Yeah, absolutely. So now watch, ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> verse six of Isaiah 40, the voice said, cry out. And he said, what shall I cry? All flesh is grass and, and it's all love, loveliness is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades because the breath of the Lord blows upon it. Surely the people of grass, the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. O Zion, you who bring good tidings, get up on the high mountain, O Jerusalem, the one who brings good tidings, lift up your voice with strength, lift, lift it up, be not afraid. Say to the cities of God, behold your God. Now he's already talked about the appearing of the glory of God. Well, what is that? That's not as Jesus in incarnation. Mm -hmm. Isaiah 42 says, well, a bruised reed shall he not break, a smoking flax shall he not quench. He will not raise his voice in the street. This is the coming of the Lord in glory. Absolutely. This is the parousia. Okay. <clears throat> So say to the cities of Judah, behold your God. Behold, the Lord God shall come with a strong arm. Once again, not the, it's not yeah. the incarnation. And he would do what? His arm shall rule. This is the kingdom. Behold, his reward is with him, his work before him. He will feed his flock like shepherd. He will gather the lambs with his arms, carry them in his bosom, and gently lead those who are with young. There's the salvation of the remnant at the same time of judgment. It's everywhere. 
I don't absolutely understand how Brown everywhere. Can see this. You know, Mike, in that book, uh, <clears throat> Elijah has already come. A solution to Roman. Yeah, Elijah has come. Uh, I have an entire chapter devoted to showing that salvation and judgment are Siamese twins that cannot be separated. I thought everybody knew that until I started running into dispensationalists. Thomas I said on one occasion, the problem with preterist is all they see is the judgment of Israel, but the coming of the Lord is for the salvation of Israel. Yeah. That's what Brown was saying too. That's exactly what Michael Brown was saying. And yet when you go to all of these old Testament passages, all of them, now one passage may emphasize salvation more than judgment, or it, another may emphasize judgment more than salvation, right? But they're all together. They are. I know they're synchronous. Right. Yeah, and that's why I, I devoted one entire chapter with passage after passage after passage, showing you cannot divorce the time of judgment from the time of salvation. It's absolutely not permissible, exegetically <laughs> wise, scripturally wise. So here we have. The coming of the Lord with a strong arm. This is judgment language. And by the way, let me point out, back up here, a voice in the wilderness, make straight in the pass or desert, a highway for our God. This is language taken from the terminology Military. of warfare, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> this, in the, in the Roman world, if you saw someone building, if you saw someone flattening everything and building a road to your city, that was not good. <laughs> uh oh, did we lose you? What happened? Don, I think your, your uh, volume is off. Yep. Sorry about that. There you go. There you go. Yeah. I, I had accidentally run over my cord and when I grabbed the control here, I accidentally punished the, uh, pushed the button. But Josephus was familiar with this history. Even the Assyrians, as far back as the Assyrians, not all countries did it, but even the Assyrians did it to a certain extent and they not as much as the Romans, but anytime they were going to invade a country, they sent out surveyors. They went out construction men, who literally built a road to pull their siege machines on to make to make the invasion go smoother. Now, the Romans were particularly effective at this, and they were most commonly the ones who did this. <clears throat> Josephus, in his Wars of the Jews, when he is speaking about Vespasian coming into the land, they were approaching the city of Jotapata. He sent out his surveyors, his road builders, and Josephus uses the language of clearing and making a highway. So when we see the language describing the message and mission of John, a voice in the wilderness makes straight in the, high, in the desert a highway for a God, even John's message was one of judgment. Well, hello. The wrath about to come. What did he say to the Pharisees? Who's warned you to flee from the wrath that is about to come? The axe is at the root of the tree. Axe is already, already at the root. The language there is really, really graphic. His winnowing fork is in his hand. And the winnowing fork is, a, is an image of the end of judgment or the end of harvest, I should say. It, it's not the initiation. It's not the, it's not the hook. It's and not the sky. already, it's the not yet. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So here's a cl classic example, ladies and, uh, ladies and gentlemen. When we acclimate ourselves, when we inform ourselves of the ancient customs and how the both the Old Testament and the New incorporate this language into their language of the Messiah and of John the Baptizer, all of a sudden, it makes audience relevance come alive. And, you know, <clears throat> I never forget Grant Jeffrey. I don't know if you're, how much you're familiar with Grant Jeffrey or, or not, Mike. He was, uh, a dispensationalist, right? he was a dispensationalist, extremely popular for a little while. He died suddenly some years ago, <laughs> but 
he wrote a book entitled The Glorious Return. And to show you how locked in many of the dispensationalists are to their literalistic hermeneutic, uh, Grant Jeffrey said there's not one single case in all of the Bible in which a, a New Testament writer interprets Old Testament language metaphorically or spiritually. And the, the moment I read that, I go, okay, so John the baptizer was a literal physical. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> he was out there throwing rocks out of the way, cutting down trees, filling up valleys, lowering mountains. And I go, oh, talk about getting locked into a, a hermeneutic and refusing, literally refusing to, to listen or to see. Yeah. So we we got to develop Isaiah 40 next week. <laughs> We're out of time right now. Well, let's let's next week what we'll do is we'll <clears throat> we'll just hit some of these Old Testament passages and then we'll just nail down on uh the meaning of mystery there and and fullness uh and and deal with full number or fullness uh, and and what that is. And then That's I too think- much for one week. <laughs> We can't do that, Mike. You know that. <laughs> okay, so I think we have one more. We have, we have part five on yeah. Romans 9 through 11. And I, yeah. I well, I, I really think it, it's certainly not a waste of our time no, to get, I, to get as fine. much information out there for people to be able to consume, to be able to consider, to understand. I mean, these three chapters, along with chapter eight, are some of the most troublesome in the entirety of Christianity. Yeah. People continue to struggle over them. And so the more information we can give, I think the better it is. And, and Don, with that. And, and Don, this is paving the way, segueing back to 1 Corinthians 15, because folks, the redemption of the body that was about to take place in Romans 8 is the corporate body. The salvation of Israel the Jew Gentile maturing, the glorification of that body is a corporate body. Daniel 12, two, partial predators concede that's a corporate body resurrection. Well, isn't 1 Corinthians 15, the resurrection of of Daniel 12? Isn't the resurrection of 1 Corinthians 15 when the redemption of the corporate body of Romans 8 is fulfilled and when all Israel is is fulfilled? It's all tied together. So once we see these corporal body positions in Romans, and then we jump back into 1 Corinthians 15, hopefully you'll see some of the connections, especially in Romans, we're dealing with the sin, the death, and the law. That's right. And the evil trinity. And we'll, we'll see those again in 1 Corinthians 15. So again, guys, thank you so much for joining us. I hope you enjoyed it. And uh, we'll see you next week. Amen. Good night. All right, man. Take- in God whose word I pray, In the Lord whose word I praise In God alone I trust I will not be afraid What can mortal man do to me?